I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week we are back in the kitchen at Andre's Confiserie Suisse. Did I say that right? Yeah, that was wonderful. <laughs> Very With good. With their chef and co-owner, Renee Bollier. Renee, thank you for inviting us back into your kitchen. We are back in your kitchen, but I want to talk a little bit before we start cooking. I want to talk a little bit about the history of Andre's here in Kansas City. Your grandfather, Andre, and let's talk a little bit about how Andre's came to be. Well, you know, Andre's was a dream of my grandfather who was living in Switzerland. He was a master pastry chef, and he realized in Switzerland the costs were just too high. He, he needed um, some place where it was affordable to start his own business. And uh, there is a reason that the U.S. is called the land of opportunity, and it gave him um, the opportunity to own his own business. And his brother was working in Kansas City, uh, said it was a phenomenal city and the market was wide open. So what year was this? This was in 1955. Grandfather came in 1955. Yeah, and uh, he got here in the fall of 55, and within a few months he had Andres open. And uh, were you at this location? We were actually one building down, but basically, okay. the, basically the, the same location. Right. And um, you know, the first 10 years I think were just dramatically hard for him. I think the reason there wasn't a whole lot of competition in the Kansas City area is because there wasn't much mar of a market. And so, so he, he helped to create the market he did. too. He did. He worked extremely hard and his initial idea or concept was pastries and chocolate candies. He didn't want to go outside of that realm. Okay, in the and, beginning. Uh, in the beginning. Yeah. But then he soon realized that he needed more to draw people in and that's when we started doing baked goods. And then a year after the opening we introduced the, the tea room or the cafe and started serving lunch. And all those things were just to bring people in with the hopes that um, they would purchase chocolate candies and pastries on the way out. We've been and, doing it ever since. Uh, yeah, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. He was an extremely hard worker, uh, exceptionally talented pastry chef, and um, he was a smart guy. So uh, Smart always helps. What what you, you and your dad, Marcel, have continued to do is preserve the integrity of what Grandfather Andre began. Um, you have been to Switzerland. Let's talk about your personal training to here. Yeah, I, um, I was lucky enough that um, since my father, who immigrated with my grandparents, is uh, first generation Swiss, that enabled me to have or retain Swiss citizenship. Yes. So I was able to go over to Switzerland for three years, uh, oh train goodness. at some absolutely exceptional pastry shops uh, that my father and my grandfather had contacts at. Sure. And um, I worked at three different places, um, one very small, one a little larger, and one that was pretty a pretty big factory and um, just learned a, an absolute immense amount of information and knowledge from some of the top pastry chefs in Switzerland. In Switzerland. I mean Swiss chocolate is famous. Um, one of the things that I adore about what you do is you are importing ingredients and seasoning and cheeses from, and of course your chocolate, from Switzerland so that when we come here to get a pastry or lunch or our chocolates, uh, it's as if we are in Switzerland. You brought it, that country, that culture here to Kansas City. Yeah, one thing that was extremely important to my grandfather, my father, and myself yes. is to stay as traditional as possible. We, um, we want to be known as, we want when a Swiss walks into Andres to feel like they're at home. Did you know when you were 10 that you wanted to continue being part of this business or is that something that came a little later? You no, know, in all honesty, I never thought of doing anything uh, else since I was a little kid. Wonderful. I mean, I looked up to my dad. I still look up to my dad and um, I loved working with him when I was young. And I still love working with him to this day. I mean, both my parents are just exceptional people You're and we have a ton of fun together. And um, so, yeah, no, I always loved the work. This was it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in high school, I didn't love getting up at three in the morning to come to work on Saturday with my dad, but. You really did. I okay, did. Okay, you did. And, um, you know, that was partly my parents. They felt like if I wanted to be part of the business in the future, I needed to be part of the business then also. You cut your teeth on this business and the chocolate and the food making and 
We've already visited downstairs. The equipment is exceptional. One of the things that I found exciting about your history is because some of the equipment is from Switzerland and we don't readily have folks in the United States that know how to work on some of these equipment. And you know how to do that a little bit. You know, I have a, a small amount of knowledge. Small One of the bit. things I did in Switzerland was, um, was I went to a factory that manufactures the machinery mm -hmm. that we use to make our chocolate candies and I got to start with just a metal frame and actually build one of the machines oh from goodness. the ground up. Okay. And what I hear from the chefs, the more you know about the space in which you work, actually the better you become at doing the work. Oh yeah. And obviously that's held true for you. So chef, what are we going to make today in the kitchen? And today we're going to make croute de fromage, which is kind of like a, a very dense cheesy mm. souffle. It has some egg to bind it, but the main predominant ingredient are two types of cheese. We have Gruyere and Emmental yes. are in the mix. Oh. And then a variety of spices, uh, Kirsch, which is uh, yes. cherry brandy and yes. something that's very popular in Switzerland. We use an immense amount of Kirsch. And, um, and with that, we're gonna make our homemade tomato soup. And how comforting, I mean, we're talking about comfort food right now, Swiss style. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we gonna make? We're gonna make a house-made tomato soup. A house-made tomato soup. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to have a spinach salad with uh, toasted pecans, red onion, and um, bacon. And bacon. And, um, with uh, Andre's signature salad dressing. Okay. All right, well, Chef, I think you and I need to go in the kitchen and start preparing the signature dish and I think you need to come with us. We are in the kitchen at Andre's with their executive chef, Renee, and we're gonna make the first of three for our signature dish, and that is the house-made tomato soup. It is. We're talking comfort here. Yep. Yes, we are. Okay, chef, where do we begin? Well, we begin with, we'll go ahead and turn the fire on, get our pan heated up a little bit and we're going to start with our butter and um, we're going to add the butter to the pan and get that melted and we're going to saute our uh, now I'm assuming this is unsalted butter this is unsalted, unsalted butter. butter a reminder to all of us also in addition to always using unsalted butter so you can control the seasoning is that you want to begin with a hot pot or a warm pot a warm pot yeah and we'll add our carrots and we're just going to let that cook down for a minute Switzerland we use lots and lots of butter but everyone eats in moderation and um, I think that's I mean eating the best of, of what life has to offer is important yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's all about moderation though yep so once that those onions a little bit translucent we'll go ahead and add our garlic you don't want to add the garlic too early this fresh chopped garlic but you add it too early and it's gonna burn it's on gonna you burn. so we, we're not doing that and you just some fresh chopped garlic mm -hmm. And you know, all of our chefs tell us that the order, first of all, you had amazing cloths. You had everything prepared, so that makes cooking more fun. You're not rushing to chop something up in time. But the timing at which you introduce the ingredients to the product makes a huge difference in the outcome. It does, it and, does. And you add the garlic too early and you either aren't gonna get the onions and the carrots done enough or your garlic's gonna yeah. burn. So we don't we don't do that. Okay. And then we're just gonna mm. let that go for a minute or so and then once the garlic really is aromatic. You can really smell that garlic. We're just going to sprinkle the whole thing with a little bit of flour, and that's just going to bind the soup. All right, and this is regular all-purpose flour. All flour. All -purpose flour. <laughs> we'll just get that mixed in. We don't want the flour to start browning and take color. We're just going to roast it just for a minute with all the vegetables. Get the vegetables nice and covered. Now, uh, something important to remind, this is not chicken broth, and you are not using bouillon. No. You are using stock, and if you don't, I know you make your own stock, but you, there are plenty of quality chicken stock products that you can get off the shelf. There are, and there are. And some what, of them are even organic. There mm -hmm. are, and low sodium, in my opinion, is the way to okay. go. So okay. you're not putting a ton of salt into your dish. You can always salt your dish at the end if it needs a little more, sure. um, a little more flavor. Everything's added, 
Um, we're gonna give it just a little bit of fresh cracked pepper, not a lot, just a little bit. To so give it a I little noticed flavor. you're introducing the seasoning towards the end. Towards uh, the end. Well, and I, it is very possible that we're gonna need to add a little bit more. Which is fine. That's yeah. um, push salt, but it's easier to add at the end than it is to take away. Yeah, that was always the trouble. So we'll go ahead and give that a quick stir, and then now the tomatoes that you added, um, they were peeled and chopped. Peeled and you chopped. You could either do that fresh, or you could do that with um, a high quality canned tomato. Yeah, a high quality canned tomato is gonna give you great results. Renee, this has been simmering for about 20 minutes. We're ready to finish it off. What do we need to do? Well, now we are gonna puree it. And okay. in my opinion, the easiest way to puree a pot of soup is with an immersion blender. So, um, and you know, just really, people are sitting there taking hot product and pouring it into a blender, then pouring it back. You don't need to do that. The one thing you do, need to remember is that not to lift the blender out of the soup while it's still on or you'll have a little bath. Yep, you will, you will. And believe me, I've had many of them I in have my time. Too. So watch I, out, yep. so watch out. So we're gonna put that in and basically we'll just start it going and kind of tilt it a little bit to get all those ingredients down in the blades. And it's gonna take a few minutes to really get it You know nice. what I haven't done and I just learned from you, I'm usually taking the blender and going round and round. I have never tilted it before and oh, yeah. now as a result of being in the kitchen with you I'm going to tilt there this we go we it. are going to make it just a little bit richer with a small amount of heavy whipping cream and you know you don't you have to use much in. but look at look at the difference oh, yeah. in the result and it's going to give the soup a really nice richness uh, and really balance out the acidity of the tomatoes. And that's, that's what those carrots point. do. Those carrots right. are so nice and sweet, and they really help balance the acidity of the tomatoes. And you know, so much about cooking is achieving that balance, and, and we are doing that here. That is a uh, beautiful soup. So now do we have to taste we it? We have to taste it. And, uh, Please remember an, to do this at home. An important part of, yes. of cooking is making sure the seasonings are correct. You should never serve anything to your guests or your family you have not tasted. My opinion, it's, it's spot on. We have the soup on. It's finished. It's blended now to the croûte au fromage. Chef, how do we make that happen? Well, we're going to start with cheese. And here at no, Andre's... that's not just any cheese. <laughs> this is imported Swiss cheese. We have a blend of Gruyere and Emmentaler. It's the two cheeses that we use pretty much in all our dishes at Andre's. So we have our cheese already grated, broken down and grated. All right, so if we're at home and we bought a wedge of cheese, someone once told me that before you grate it, if you stick it in the freezer for about 10-ish minutes, it grates easier. Oh, would yeah. Would you recommend that? I would. You the would? worst thing you could ever do is try to grate warm cheese. OK, we won't It's soft. That. It's oily. It's it's a mess. So okay. yeah, the colder the cheese is, the easier you're going to have, okay. the easier time you'll have. All right, now to that cheese mixture, we will add what? We are going to add our seasonings and our egg and our cream mm. that um, will bind everything together and give the cheese some, some oomph and some flavor. Oh, yes. Uh, so what we have is three eggs. Yes. We have cream. We have kirsch, the cherry brandy that in Switzerland we use in lots of different dishes. Wonderful aroma. Fresh cracked pepper and salt. Yes. Uh, that is white wine, a dry white wine. Like a Sauvignon Blanc or yeah. something like that? Okay. Perfect. And that is maji, so it is uh, it is similar to soy sauce. It again is uh, something made in Switzerland. It's a wheat product. Uh, but it has a very similar taste to soy sauce. Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and start dumping all these ingredients just go together. And thank you for including all of these Swiss products and ingredients to preserve the culture there you go. of Switzerland for us in Kansas City. Yep, we try to, to use all as many ingredients as we possibly can that are used in Switzerland. And like I said, we try to stay as traditional as possible. And um, part of those traditions are uh, held up in the ingredients that we use. So we'll just go ahead and get that mixed up a little bit, just so when we add it to the cheese, we don't have to over mix the cheese. Uh, so the ingredients are evenly dispersed through it. So once that's mixed together, we'll take our whip out. And you know, and sometimes people take and throw the ingredients right onto the cheese, and then you're fighting to get that even mixture. You exactly. reminded us to do it before the exactly. cheese. Exactly. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and put a glove on because I'm going to use my hands to mix this up. And basically, I'll just drizzle this egg mixture over the cheese. 
And you know, my hands are the best tool. In the they kitchen. are. You know, they, they are. came first before the whisk. So we'll go ahead, and you're looking at the cheese should be nice and moist when you're done, but it shouldn't be sloppy. It shouldn't be wet. And so now we have um, Andre's French bread. So about any French bread uh, mm -hmm. will do. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna go ahead and top each slice of French bread. And, and what's, you are very generous when you do this. Oh yeah, you need enough. And what's real important with crouton fromage, and anyone who's made it before will learn very quickly, okay. is that they wanna make sure that all the edges are covered. If you leave the edges exposed of the bread, then you're gonna end up, the bread that's not covered in cheese will burn. You know, and, and an important piece also then is that every bite has a generous portion of cheese oh, yeah. on it. I mean, it's, it, it serves multi-purposes for you to uh, build it this way. It does. It does, so okay. we'll get all... And we're going to put this in a salamander, but for those of us who don't have commercial kitchen and may not have a salamander, would you put this under the, the broiler? Under the broiler, yep, just on a medium-high heat. So typically we let these refrigerate for 20 to 30 minutes. What that does is it helps the ingredients kind of infuse into that cheese. Um, it's going to flow a little bit less when you do that. We have done soup. We've got the croche au fromage and the salamander, and now for the salad to get ready for plating. What are, how are we going to put that together? Well, this is really straightforward. Basically, we sliced a red onion yes. nice and thin, toasted some pecans, mm -hmm. and then fried some small bacon pieces. Yum. We're going to mix. We're going to put all those into a bowl. And what's going to make this salad is all the ingredients, but the key is Andre's salad dressing. I'll bet. It's our signature salad dressing, um, and it's something we sell lots of, and I feel like people really enjoy. And so we're just gonna drizzle a little bit of that in there, and all so those flavors. So you put the salad dressing in before you add your spinach? We're going to. I'm gonna okay. mix that all together so that Good it's, idea. it's all those flavors kind of mixed together and blend together, and then we're gonna put the spinach on top of that. And um, basically, if I was doing it this home, I'd take it this far. I'd put my spinach on top and just leave it leave alone, alone and wait till I'm ready to serve. When I'm ready to serve, then I toss it and it's ready to go. So I'll go ahead and add that in. We and you need know, to remember to do that, that you really shouldn't be tossing it just before plating or serving. Exactly. Uh, and you want to you wanna err on the side of caution when adding okay. the salad dressing. You don't want to overdress your salad. Okay, chef, you have been cooking. And now it's time to play present because you know we eat with our eyes first. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna start with a soup and we'll just ladle a nice portion into our bowl. We wanna make sure that the bowl's nice and warm so it doesn't cool down the soup. You know, what a kindness for your guests. I noticed that your plates are slightly warm, not to burn your gas, but to retain the heat of the, exactly. of the dish. Exactly. And right. we're in the soup, we're gonna put just a little bit of chopped Italian parsley right in the middle, just for a garnish. Then we'll grab our salad bowl, put a nice helping of our spinach salad in there. Wanting to make sure that we get pecans and bacon mixed in. We'll set that right there. And then we have our croute that's ready to go, nice and golden brown. Grab that, set that on the side right there. Put everything in nicely, and we are ready to go. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and we have been back in the kitchen at Andre's making another signature dish. To taste this creation, we have founder and CEO Danny O'Neill of the Roastery Coffee. Danny, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule uh, it's great to, be to here. perform this task. It's great to be here. I'll <laughs> sacrifice myself like this any day of the week. <laughs> okay, Danny Chef, what have we prepared? Well, today we have uh, crypto fromage, which is a mixture of Swiss cheeses. Uh, of different spices mm. and eggs, kind of like a cheese souffle yes. on our uh, our own French bread, and then we have to go with it a homemade tomato soup mm. and spinach salad with red onions, bacon, and pecans in it. Chef, thank you. I know you'll be back around with the dessert cart, but we need to do first things first. Bon appetit. Enjoy. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Okay, you you have to taste first. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. Well, never once smells delicious. You know, mm. there's no substitute for house, homemade, house-made. <gasps> homemade. Everything they do makes makes a difference. And from scratch, and you know they are mm. utterly devoted to their Swiss heritage. So the ingredients is imported from Switzerland mm. just to maintain that culture for Kansas City. Mm. This is sort of like the French version of Perkinsier. Oh, oh. Mm. Mm. yum. A man of taste, what are you tasting? Very delicate, um, creamy, smooth, buttery, soft, um, incredibly delicious. <laughs> and, really uh, delicious. Awesome. And they really ob obviously they complement each other. I'm sure it was designed that way, but. So, um, well, it's comfort food. Yeah. You know, the old tomato soup and toasted cheese sandwich kicked up several notches in the Swiss yeah. version. Now, I'm going to dig into the salad because mm. there's bacon in here, and we have determined that bacon is a food group. You may not have seen yeah. that on a nutritional chart, but it is. Mm. That's some salad dressing. Oh, my goodness. Same, you think of a salad is so simple. What can you do with the salad? But the nuance and the flavors, when you when it's homemade, it's just the, the um, flavor profile is just really wide. There's all kinds of nuances in, in the middle of it. And I always think about that with uh, a great coffee. It's the same thing with food. Um, I could definitely eat this every day. They just leave absolutely nothing to chance. Nothing. They sweat every detail and it all makes a difference. Every once in a while, I remember talking to Marcel years ago about the different little steps and does it all make a difference? And he goes, I know they all make a difference together, so which ones of those are you gonna take out? I'm not gonna take any of them out. And it really does make a difference. And because for decades, we know that when we come to Andre's, we're not gonna have to worry about what is this a quality experience, you open up, I love their almonds that have been, of course, coated in chocolate and dusted with powdered sugar, and it's always going to be fabulous. That consistency, and you know from coffee, so let's talk about the roastery. I understand that Andre's was one of your first one of our very first, and you know, we had our sights set on them, and we thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to tell Marcel this, but I thought, I want them so badly, I would almost give them the coffee if they would use it. Um, and that's how his opinion it counts for so much. So once Marcel used our coffee, a whole bunch of other folks um, jumped in line right away. Pine, they were, they, they and they you got were on pioneers, board yes. Because everybody knows how picky Marcel is. In a great way, he's very, as you know, mm -hmm. very kind, very diplomat, diplomatic, very elegant, but incredibly picky. And it, it was it was just awesome. We we, we um, did 17 different shots of espresso, Marcel and I, in January of 1994. Oh my goodness! I, I tell people that 20 years. That was the first and only time I really ever OD'd on coffee. It, oh my gosh. It takes a lot for you, I know. Oh my gosh, but it was, uh, can you imagine? I mean, Marcel sitting down and, and doing Because he wanted seven. just the right blend. Absolutely, and, yeah, yeah. And it's wonderful that the two of you have this history and you've oh. been a part of each other's professional lives. Yeah. I just have absolute yeah. immense respect for well, Danny, coming from you, I said earlier, a man of taste, I mean, that's what you're about, too. In coffee, you've made signature blends for many of the very best restaurants in Kansas City. You're on the shelf in the better grocery stores, and um, I want to thank you also for spending time, the time and care that you have taken to deliver consistently fabulous products to us. Well, I so I think we should take a few more bites, but oh. I want you to make sure to save room for the dessert card. Okay, Danny, we finished lunch, made all gone, I'm proud. But what would lunch be without dessert? Especially at Andre's. Especially, Especially at, Andre's. at Andre's. So, Chef, I, I you- I come here yes? and skip lunch and just have dessert. We won't tell you. No, no. Okay. Chef, what do you what do we have to select from? 
Well, oh today we word. have a variety of signature Andre's mm. desserts. Yes. This is a adoboche, which is seven layers of yellow cake <laughs> with our signature ganache, um, some chocolate inside. This is a lemon tartlet, mm. so our homemade lemon curd with lemon buttercream and a sugar dough shell. Our Matterhorn, which is our <laughs> biggest seller, which is chocolate buttercream chocolate cake with chocolate fauna on top. Um, mocha roulade, which is a uh, an almond roulade with mocha buttercream. Yes. Another one of our most popular yes. um, pastries, which is the Napoleon, which is three layers of puff pastry and vanilla flavored whipped cream in the middle. And then our Luxembourgerly or French macaroons, as they're known in the U.S. Um, we have a strawberry, a chocolate, and a vanilla with a little bit of whipped cream to go along with those. You know, it's a, it, it's of course art and delicious both. Danny, you need to select first. I know oh. it's a tough decision. You can do this though. I'll do the. Is it seven layer? Yeah, the dobo. Mm -hmm. Dobo. Mm -hmm. I go. think I'm gonna do the matter one because perfect. I'm a chocolate girl too. There you go. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you, thank, thank you, you chef. Right. Okay. Dickin, you get to take the very first bite. Have you had this one before? I have. Oh, well, and I usually go with this one here. So something different. Something different. Oh my. Oh. Smooth. Very chocolatey. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Mm -hmm. oh. Mine is like the finest chocolate. Well, a chocolate lover could be happy with either of these. See, they are kind of the perfect combination of light and dark. Yes. Oh, this is so good. All right. Now, and this is one of the things I love about Kansas City, is how the foodies do collaborations. Mm -hmm. Your love and devotion to fabulous tasting things has gone to a collaboration between coffee and chocolate. And uh, tell us about what you're doing. And this is a new, relatively new. Yeah, we, um, natural is Renee's idea that came came up with a um, light and dark chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. um, super, super, super high end with incorporating our Gotham espresso inside of it. I love this. But this See? is awesome. Ooh. Mm. All right, no, I have not tasted this. I'm mean, gonna have an addiction before I leave. I'm a dark chocolate fan, but in this case, I like them equally well. Just depends on what mood I'm in. This is the best combination of chocolate and coffee awesome. I've ever tasted. No, I've, I've, I've heard this that This is said. the best combination of chocolate and coffee I've ever tasted. I've heard that said a number of times. And I will tell you why. It's because of what you did to the coffee, Oh, that's amazing. Is that incredible? Yes. I have a new addiction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you not only for this, but for all you've done for our city. You have always been there for the community. Whenever a not-for-profit or an organization has been out there trying to raise money, whatever the good cause is, you've had a presence and you've made a contribution. Well, we've had a lot of great examples of simply try to follow what others have done and Folks like Barnett and Henry and Marcel, we've just had great, wonderful examples in front of us. So. Well, thank you for you continu continuing that tradition here in Kansas City. And thank you for all the wonderful coffee and for taking time to be our celebrity taster. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Thank you. Appreciate it. We continue our special series in the cellar with visiting the vineyard and to do that this week Chris Cribb and I are at a very special place in Parkville, Missouri. Wines by Jennifer and this is Jennifer. Hello. Hi Jennifer. Hey, Hola. Hola. <laughs> <laughs> this is utterly charming. This house is over a hundred years old and yes. what what is the experience here at Wines by Jennifer? Every room is a different country and we are now in Spain. Okay. Welcome to Spain. Welcome I'm, to Spain, and you, know, you two we, have been there. Jennifer had a chance to visit uh, Bodegas La Parisma a couple years ago, and so I thought, let's uh, get together and talk about visiting the vineyard in Spain and kind of understand about what is different there in terms of the wines they're making, the climate, the elevation, 
Heck, we even got rocks. That's right. <laughs> rocks. Thank you to, to Jennifer. So what is unique about this area of Yekla? I mean, there's a, a different approach to winemaking there. What is it? Well, I'm first going to give you the map and okay. say, look, you look at the map and you go in Spain, you're on the southern side of Spain mm -hmm. and you're a little bit to the south. Um, and a little bit towards the, the, the coast. Uh, mm -hmm. The state is Murcia, and this area is kind of a high plateau. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, you know, it's not, it's not crazy rocky area, but mm -hmm. it's, it's higher in elevation than the number of the other areas around. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, um, and what they've tried to be able to do is really focus in, uh, one grape has kind of been their champion, uh, on the red wines, and that's uh, Monastro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also known as Muvedra. So there's a lot of little vineyards in Yekla. How have they come together to make wine? So I, I found when I looked into this area that um, there has been a history of winemaking that um, goes back about uh, 50 years as to this one cooperative. Okay. And so the idea of a cooperative um, is that growers got together, get together to be able to, um, you know, increase their power and have since then been able to market a number of wines. So there's a number, 200 some growers that all have their own individual farm and own plots of land that they take care of and the fruit is then graded and gone into the system where the, the head winemaker and, and group is able to vinify and find specific mm -hmm. products. And I think so that most what does old hands mean then? Well, old hands is one of their micro batches. And through the use of technology, now they've found few vineyards that they do specifically by themselves. So they mm. take one vineyard, they, mm -hmm. they take it apart, they vinify it separately. They crush it, they stem it, they do everything separate so that this wine, for example, is 100% organic. Mm -hmm. So there's no pesticides, ah. herbicides in the vineyard. They do um, specifically um, try to give it a little bit more earthiness mm -hmm. than some of their other products. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of the other wines in the, this Old Hand series have some Syrah in them, but this one it has no Syrah, mm -hmm. so it's just 100% Monastrell. So Old Hands from the winemaker, actually, if you look at the, the Old Hands label, you'll see yes. um, these two set of hands. It's an homage to the winemaker's father who originally brought fruit into the cooperative. So he is now the winemaker of for, for all of Bodegas La Parisma, and he makes the, the three wines we have here. We have a, a, a Caparota. Oh, thank you. The Caparota um, Macabeo. Is that what you're wanting us to taste now and tell us what that is? Sure, sure. This is um, a white wine, Spain white wine. Um, it's known for kind of being a little bit nutty, mm -hmm. a little bit of sweetness to it. A uh, very smooth finish to it. Ah, uh, that is a very unique wine. Very nice. That is very unique. That's delicious. It starts out one way and ends up. So it's, it's got a, ni a nice body to it, like a longer finish. Um, the uh, the idea behind Macabeo is a grape type. It, it, it grows in this warmer, hot mm -hmm. environment. And it is windy too. It's the breezy, so there's lots of breeze. Yep. So when you were standing there in these vineyards, the wind was blowing mm -hmm. and what, and you've been to many vineyards, what was unique about these vineyards? I think it was just the beautiful, vast scenery around. Mm -hmm. You could see for miles and miles around. Now granted, I was up on top of the, <laughs> of where the grapes come in and filming mm -hmm. up, up this tiny little stairs, but the breeze was blowing. It was just absolutely serene with all the vineyards around and not a lot of village. It's really a very small community, if you remember right. So they, they take a lot of pride in the winemaking in this region. And part of the cooperative um, piece of it is that it's making sure that the small farmer that owns that land owns it and it gets passed down to family to family and taken care of by you know these specific families and that's the that's the gist of a cooperative and they and they're very prideful about that they make great wines at the cooperative mm -hmm. that they have great fruit in the cooperative because that's also their tourist badge if you will mm -hmm. this is you know come wow. visit our place and you can yeah have a sense of place through our wines. Mm -hmm. um, so. so, and so we see DO on some of the wines. What does that mean? Well, the, um, the DO is a, is a way in Spain that they tell what region, how you separate the regions. Okay. And each of the regions 
uh, in some regions have their own rules and quality levels mm -hmm. and ideas that you can be sort able to. Sort of like a stamp of approval, a good it's, housekeeping yes, stamp it really of approval is. And, and, not, and not every area is given that. You have to earn it and you are granted it through a, a process. So we have the Monastrell, and then we have the Old Hands. Yeah, so the Organic Monastrell, and then the Tropeo mm -hmm. is um, uh, kind of our big, bad red wine. Mm -hmm. The big, bad. Um, it's the Cabernet of It's the special Spain. wine. It's yeah. the special wine, especially from this particular uh, winery. Yes. Okay. It's, uh, this is what they've been, this is the best of the best batches mm -hmm. that they get. Wow. It's made from uh, Monastrell, and... Um, the vineyards that it comes from are what we call ungrafted vineyards. Mm -hmm. So they really need, a pure. They were there was a problem where a bug called yeah. phylloxera mm -hmm. came into uh, the vineyards in Europe and mm -hmm. basically ate the rootstock. Mm -hmm. The only silently way silently slowly. Yeah, the only way <laughs> that people were able to save it is they would graft onto American rootstock, and um, this one vineyard that Trapeo comes from never had to do that process. So it wow. is like you're taking a step into history because you actually get mm -hmm. to taste the wine from the rootstock that it came from. Hundreds of years ago. Yeah, from the same mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. idea. So it's okay. it's a it's a neat, you know, comparison there and what we like to, to show in it is how you can take a big red wine and kind of put a soft glove over the mm -hmm. top of it and they smooth it out with some mm -hmm. nice oak. And Very small quantities of being made of this particular wine because the fruit, when it gets that old, it doesn't produce as many great uh, clusters. And so the production is very small, so that's very, very, uh, very limited. Would you say... And in the vineyard, mm -hmm. this is another interesting mm -hmm. piece. Um, these, on both of the monastrels, these are bush vines. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of no guide wires to hold the vines. Oh, they're just I, like I a do. little shrub. It's like a little bush. Uh -huh, little this bush. is like a little shrub. Yeah, and okay. it's, mm -hmm. they're separated by a large amount of territory there because um, the rootstock have been there so long. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they're it's established almost, root yeah, system. almost two meters like mm -hmm. apart. That's and right. So it's a. Um, it's, it, the vineyard looks different. Mm -hmm. um, so this looks different than the typical vineyard that we that we would see because they, it produces less fruit. Would you say there's a more intense flavor to the fruit that is produced? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we taste this? I mean, yes. we've been talking about it's it. It's red wine time. Okay, <laughs> red wine. We did the white, and that was yummy. And so Trapeo, um, mm -hmm. and this is this is the little bush guy <laughs> who's mm -hmm. yep. This is uh, my one little Spanish lesson. They okay. told me that means spirit of the bull. Of mm, the bull. Yes. Very good. So you can see okay. the, the, the bull on the... Um, it's a gorgeous oh, label, too. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's, it was interesting to hear you say that uh, this comes in a beautiful box, and when you were coming back, you made your husband carry it back for you. <laughs> so, so let's have a little snap. Okay. To life. Mm, to life. Cheers. Look at the color. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. This was our parting gift ah, wow. good. from Natalie. Uh, I taste tannins too. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a serious wine. It's got a lot of a lot of fruit, a lot of um, spice to it mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. A lot of spice. Um, that is nice. The, I'm understanding now what you're saying about how you can look at the land and know, so we were in Argentina mm -hmm. last week. Now we're in Yecla and the different description of the land um, is reflected in the, what happens in the glass. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, and it's also the grapes and what people have, have learned over mm -hmm. years to say this is the right stuff to grow in this soil. You know, people have, have been trying to do as much as possible to get the, the expression of the fruit mm -hmm. and everything. That's, that's, right. that's the, being a shepherd of what you're, what you're able to do, that's what this winery, the winemaker here, um, Pedro, is, is looking to do is just, I, I've got all these, this great fruit from the cooperative, from the, the mm -hmm. growers, from you know, even his, his father's mm -hmm. vineyards. Mm -hmm. And all he's really trying to do is to show that um, with minimal wine techniques. So I mean, there's and it's the integrity. And it's different every year too, which I think is huh? really important with these small producers, is that they let whatever the vintage is shine through. Ah. And they don't try to manipulate. They want, you know, they let it shine if it's a... So it's 
so consistent in terms of the winemaking practices, but also being respectful of this year the grape tastes one way, next year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And with this area, it, this is also a, somewhat of a value area. Mm -hmm. You know, we, mm -hmm. we've tried as Marquee to find yeah. wines that are great value for the price. And, um, you know, this I, I think of as a $50 wine that doesn't cost you $50. That's right. So, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, that's nice. And that, that is wonderful about how we've expanded our our interests and your portfolio to include parts of the globe that normally we don't have the opportunity to be tasting and drinking. Thank you for hosting Thank our you. venture to Yecla, Spain. Cheers. 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 Nos vemos.